Session 1.2, how do blockchains work? So, we now know that blockchains are a distributed decentralized ledger. What we haven't discussed though, is that not only the form of ledger transformed, but also the way we record transactions. Because now, for the first time in hum human history as well, we can automatically let transaction record itself and makes, uh, make decisions on its own based on the code that we give him the so-called smart contracts. We will discuss the smart contracts later, but keep in mind here, key point, key takeaway is that the form of ledger changed from centralized to decentralized, but also the way we record transactions. So we have a double momentum in time where we change the ledger technology. Okay, so um, I did a deep dive regarding the official definition of what a blockchain is, and unfortunately I could not give you one single solid answer. And I think the, this, is the, this is caused by the fact that blockchain is very multidisciplinary, so you will most likely receive a different answer from somebody with an IT background than when you ask somebody with a legal background, or uh, if you ask Wikipedia, for example. So what I did here is that I posted down, uh, or I copied, paste two definitions, the one from Wikipedia, as you can read in the slides, as well as on the next slide, the one from the uh, Bitcoin source code in this case, so the very first uh, open public blockchain. And you will most likely see there's a red line that connects both of them, but in essence, they're a bit different. Or let me rephrase it, in essence, they're the same, but they're nuanced in a different perspective. Easily seen as, for example, that the Bitcoin source call, code call, talks about, here we go, uh, nodes collecting new transactions, hashings, proof of work, hash trees, etc. Where Wikipedia is called in uh, talking about more generalistic terms, right? So, bottom line here is that the answer depends on who you ask. And that's what I meant with there's most likely a corner or an angle for you that is very interesting and where you can actually start contributing based upon your own specialism. So, we now know what they are, but we don't know how they work. And that's where this session is all about. So, let me get to the next slide where we uh, see a geographical, uh, slightly uh, nuanced overview of the world with a beautiful pasted uh, note, or in this case, five nodes across the world. As you can see in an instant, this, uh, this image is distributed, right? The nodes are spread across the world. They're in uh, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and um, in Asia slash a bit of uh, Australia, Oceania. Um, bottom line here is that this is a distributed image, but you can instantly see that this is not specifically a decentralized because it seems like it's the same picture or it seems like it's the same picture everywhere. So this could also be a centralized version. So um, refrain from the picture, just imagine that each node is a different person, right? So we have five different nodes in five different locations. So it's distributed, it's decentralized. That's the very first version and there's nothing new here on the horizon. We already discussed this. So let's go to the second session. So version two. When you imagine these five nodes starting to record transactions between people around the world, in this case, sending borderless transactions, transactions who doesn't care about legal jurisdictions, it doesn't care who you are, which can't be altered, right? All the properties of open public blockchains. All of a sudden, though, because it's a mining race, we have two similar blocks, right? In this uh, example, represented by a purple block and a black block, black block. So what do we need to do now? This is a, an expression of the Byzantine general problem. All of a sudden, we have two truths, but we need to make a decision, right? You need to pick one. How does this translate to a blockchain? The node can only follow one blockchain. So the node needs to pick whether to go with the purple block or whether to go with the black block. The first thing the node will do, of course, is check, is this block valid? Well, it most likely is, otherwise the miner wouldn't have presented it to the world because already they know that if it's not valid, the other nodes won't accept it. So let's assume both nodes are valid, right? And both are represented in the same time. So if we skip back to the previous um, example, let's say that South America mined the block simultaneously with Africa. So they both, South Africa and 
South America, or sorry, uh, Africa as well as South America, both mined the same block in exactly the same time. The South American block communicates it to the American block, and the African block communicates it to the European block. And all of a sudden the block, or the node I mean, in uh, Asia needs to pick one. Which is the right one? Do I go for Africa or do I go for South America? Both are valid. So the node in um, Asia has a problem. There's only one single source of truth, so they need to pick one, right? So in this case, the node, um, and this is one of the rules determined by Satoshi in the consensus rules, the solution here is quite simple. The Asian block needs to pick the node, or uh, needs to pick the, sorry, the Asian node needs to pick the block, which is uh, the furthest up ahead. So in this case, when we skip back to the next slide with the purple and black blocks, the Eurasian node needs to pick a block which is the longest chain. So if, for example, one, somebody presents page 11 or block 11 and somebody else presents page 13, the node needs to pick page 13, which is of course quite logical game incentive as well, because if you are mining the next block and if you are following the page 11 and if you manage to mine block 12, page 12 already exists and all the other nodes already accepted page 12. So why the hell would you start mining page 12? You want to start as fast as possible at the new page which nobody currently has. You want to write the future, not want to rewrite the past, right? So you will start with the longest chain principle. Keep in mind on the side note here that different blockchains have different consensus rules, but in case of Bitcoin, nodes need to follow the longest chain. So only one miner in this case can win. It's either the purple block, South America, or it's the black block, Africa. Now, well, let's say that they uh, in Asia pick the African block because it was a millisecond faster than the South American block, and let's say they will mine that block. Now all of a sudden we're in a mining race. Right? One half of the nodes go for uh, the American part, the other half goes for the African part. Who deter what determines who wins the race? Whatever party or whatever 50% mines the next block will communicate that one to all the other nodes and then all of a sudden somebody realizes, hey, I'm still working at page 14, but they already managed to mine page 14. So then you need to make a decision. Am I going to finish page 14 and try to catch up with them with page 15, or will I give up and take the costs for as they are and start mining page 15 as well. A neutral node who didn't already engage in page 15 will of course follow the longest chain. So the longest chain keeps, uh, more and more nodes are moving the longest uh, towards the longest chain. So the shortest chain all of a sudden needs to pick the hash powering drops the, so the decision becomes easier and easier and eventually people will start migrating to the longest chain, in this case in the picture represented by the black blocks. And this is how Satoshi Nakamoto solved the Byzantine general problem, by implementing the rule of the longest chain, where nodes need to follow the longest chain as possible, determining that's the truth, that's the source of the single source of truth, because that's where the most energy, the most power, the most security is in. So that's the most secure chain. Which means that the other blocks, in this case mined by South America, the purple block, they vanish. And, um, which doesn't mean, of course, that your transactions vanish in those blocks. Because most likely your transaction from person A to person B is recorded in the purple block as well as in the black block. So most likely you as a user won't notice it at all. Even if it was the case that your transaction was in the purple block, you might or you will most likely be in the second black block as well. You would only need to wait 10 more minutes. Of course, this can be uh, quite inconvenient when you have a very big transaction waiting. But in case of uh, buying an ice cream or something, it really doesn't matter. So that was version two. Let's go to version three now. So how does this actually work before we will go into the nitty gritty part? First of all, you need to realize it's open and public, so everybody can join. 
which is the beauty, of course, of open public blockchains. So what you can do is you can basically download, go to bitcoin.org, download the entire blockchain. In other words, rewrite every page, every transaction, if you're going for a full node, which we will discuss later what it is, which, of course, depending on the, the, the broadband of your internet, will take you approximately one to two weeks. If you have a decent computer, decent internet, it will take you one or two, two weeks to entirely rewrite, copy-paste the history of the Bitcoin node. Then after two weeks, you're up to speed. And then you are one of the nodes currently represented by a picture in the world and one of the 10,000 nodes that are currently existing in the Bitcoin network. So why would you do that? For example, if you want to start to mine, you need to know what the current block is, but also if you want to start to trade uh, high amounts, if you want to sell stuff, you need to know what the current truth is, right? If you receive money, you want to know as best as possible, did I actually receive it? Of course, you can use a front end like blockchain.info, but there you would be trusting on blockchain.info instead of on your own information, which might uh, bite you up in the ass afterward. So let's say you bought uh, something like uh, a Raspberry Pi, small computer, where you download the entire blockchain, approximately 165 or 170 gig nowadays. It takes you one or two weeks and you're up to speed. People will keep on transacting, right? Approximately 2,000 transactions per block. So all of a sudden, when they need to get recorded, the miners start uh, grabbing them from the mempool, putting them into a new block, racing, and then, ta-da, we've got a new block. Hey, Node, wake up over there at the egg. We've got a new, uh, new block. Please check whether it's valid. Then I will check, okay, are these peer-to-peer -peer transactions indeed valid? Did these persons have the money? In other words, can I look up in the ledger? Do they actually have this amount? Can they send it to that person? Is it a valid address? Did the Coinbase transaction include 12 and a half Bitcoin plus fee, etc., etc.? They check 22 things. And then after this checklist, if I deem it valid as a node, I will record the page. And then all of a sudden, it entirely starts over and over again. So without an intermediary, we can start sending value across borders, across uh, which is neutral, which can't be altered, which has a fixed or limited money supply, and in other words, which basically can be joined by everybody. So we have an entirely new form of open ledger, eventually uh, even recording new forms of data. Because, of course, we're not literally sending bitcoins from A to P, we're just sending pieces of data from person A to person B. And as I will show you later on, we can also transform that data and let it do things on its own with the so-called smart contracts. So not only is it uh, without intermediaries, it's also smart data that we're transacting. Currently, we call this smart data bitcoins, of course, more nuanced, but we will explain that one later. Just remember, we don't use a coordinating party and it's value sent across the world without borders. Where the, where the internet is used to send information, we use blockchains to send information slash value. Where the internet copies, and, uh, copies information and sends it forward, a blockchain actually pushes the value forward. So, and this is where the, the real uh, experts uh, come in. Uh, this is also a very new factor for me as well. So I got a lot of my knowledge just basically strolling down the internet. I've watched many, many, many movies. How does a blockchain work? Um, and I did you a solid here. I um, uh, collected the most, or basically I selected the most important one according to me and the people uh, around me that I asked for. This is a very, very good movie or a short clip that really explains in a, in a very high level with the right amount of details how a blockchain actually works. So from the bottom of my heart, truly, truly watch this video if you want to learn how a blockchain works. It is very important that if you want to continue with this course that you have seen this video because we will often refer to it. But you will also start to realize how the cryptographic security works, what a hash is, how the blocks are chained with each other. We uh, discussed within the team whether I needed to add something in this video, but basically this video is so good that I have nothing to add anymore. So do yourself a huge favor, 
grab at least 34 minutes because it's 70 minutes, but you need to watch it twice because then it will actually start to make sense. And watch this video from Anders.com and I will see you as a more enlightened person in next session where we will discuss more about Satoshi Nakamoto. Arigato.